it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Church, you may be seated. doing this morning? Good, good, good. We're just taking a second while that pulpit comes up here. Can we just ponder what we just sang? Y'all, that song has been on repeat in my heart, in mine. As I prepared to preach this morning, I just kept hearing over and over and over again in my head, in my heart, holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the Roaring Lion. And as we gather here this morning, it is my prayer that we would just take a moment. Take a moment to behold him. If you all would, pray with me, and then we'll dive in. Oh God, how desperately we need you now. Oh, that we would behold you, that we would see you, that we would would believe you to be who you say you are, that we would experience depths of your grace. So, Lord, now I pray that you would move me to the background. Would you come to the forefront? Would you meet your people? Would you show us your glory? It is our heart's desire to hear from you. And, Lord, we pray all this in your perfect name. Jesus, amen. Amen. If you all don't know me, what's up, NPR, by the way? I said, what's up to Northeast? What's up, NPR? So good to be here with you guys. If you guys don't know me, my name is Joseph Anderson, and I serve as the campus pastor, and I'm extremely excited to be here with you all this morning. Now, today we are going to be in 1 Samuel. We're continuing our journey through 1 Samuel, and we're going to be in chapters, plural, 4, 5, and 6. All right, so y'all know that means I have two hours, and buckle in. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But what we've learned in our story to this point is what we've seen is Israel on the decline, right? Their high priest, Eli, as he has aged, has become fat and blind, and he has proven himself to be quite incompetent. His sons, the heirs to his priesthood, are Hophni and Phinehas, and they have proven themselves to be evil priests. But last week... We came to a character named Samuel, and he was our glimmer of hope for the book. He is the one that the Lord who called him to be a prophet, he was the one sleeping in the presence of the ark. And we left off last week hearing him pray, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And we learned that there was yet hope, yet a glimmer of light, yet a silver lining for Israel. But... Samuel is nowhere to be seen in our passage today. No, you see, the passage that we will wrestle through today is a difficult and dark passage. In it, we will be forced to confront the realities of God's judgment. This, said plainly, is not a happy text. There's no one in here that you want to be like. In essence, we see a bunch of sinful people rebelling against God and God executing his judgment against them. Today is kind of like that part in the movie that we hate. You know what part I'm talking about? The part where the protagonist makes a poor decision or is defeated by the villain. This is the part of the movie where Scar hurls Mufasa from the cliffs to his death. 
That's from The Lion King, by the way, for those of y'all born after 2000. <laughs> right? But basically, y'all, what, we need, what we're going to see in our text today, to give you just a quick overview, is God's going to defeat the people of Israel twice, once worse than the other. He's going to go to the Philistines, execute their God. He's going to return to Israel and judge the people of God again. There are no rainbows and butterflies here. It's the dark part. It's the low point of the story. The part maybe that we wish wasn't there. But isn't it funny how even though we cringe at these parts, we know they're necessary? Like, like we know that without conflict, there's no opportunity for redemption, right? Like without friction, there's no opportunity for love, right? Movies that don't dip before the climax get 32% on Rotten Tomatoes, <laughs> right? Like they put them all in one channel called Hallmark, so we don't watch those. In many ways, y'all, we know that the low points are necessary, as painful as they are to watch, as much as they twist our insides, as badly as we want to turn away, we know that they are there for a reason. The same can be said for the way that this particular story unfolds. We must remember that this section is a part of the entire book of 1 Samuel and a part of the entire whole of Scripture. But still, even with that knowledge, it's hard to watch. But today, we will see that this part of the story is also necessary. We will learn that God's judgment is necessary. And we can only see this when we can clearly understand God's heart in judgment. So if you're with me today, if you're taking notes, I want to tag today's sermon, God's heart in judgment with God is for you by being against you. Now, as we dive in, I need to make one more quick aside. In general, there are two kinds of suffering, right? There's the kind of suffering that is caused by the brokenness of this world, right? And there's the kind of suffering that is caused as the consequence and the judgment on our sin. And today, we're going to focus on the harder, or shall I say the latter. We will focus on God's judgment. And our objective is to explore why does God judge? We will ask repeatedly, when can we expect God's judgment? And what we are not seeking to do, guys, hear me clearly on this, we are not seeking to determine whether your current circumstances are a product of God's wrath. In other words, there are some of you in here who are suffering just like Hannah was a couple of weeks ago. Suffering due to no sin of your own. Suffering through infertility and heartbreak and depression and anxiety. We are not seeking to answer the question, is this a result of God's wrath? I would even dare to say that that is the wrong question. The question we want to ask ourselves today is that, is there anything in my heart? Is there anything in my life that would lead me to expect the judgment of God? That's the question we're seeking to answer. And so hold on to that, and let's dive in. If you have your Bible, today we will be in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Israel went out to meet the Philistines in battle and camped at Ebenezer while the Philistines camped at Aphek. The Philistines lined up in battle formation against Israel. And as the battle intensified, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who struck down about 4,000 men on the battlefield. Okay, so let's lay the background here. We have these two parties. We have Israel and the Philistines. And they are embittered rivals, right? Like, to this point in the Old Testament, we have seen Israel go to battle with the Philistines over and over and over. Right? They battle with them all throughout the book of Judges. Then we get this quick repeat, reprieve in the book of Ruth, and here we are in 1 Samuel, and the Philistines and the Israelites are back at it again. They battle all throughout this book and the next book. So basically what we see here is that these two are mortal enemies 
the likes of the world has rarely seen, right? Like, this is worse than Magic and Bird in the 80s, right? This is worse than Chris Rock and Will Smith at the Oscars. This, <laughs> this is an A1 Stangus beef, right? Like, this is a problem. And so here we are in 1 Samuel, and these two are at it again. This day was like many others for them, right? They had been at war with them over and over again, but this day, Israel was handed a decisive defeat. The text says that about 4,000 men were struck down on the battlefield, and then they come up with this question. Verse 3, they ask, why did the Lord defeat us today before the Philistines? They were confused. They thought, how could we lose? They had a covenant with the God of the universe. God told them in Exodus, if you will be careful to obey me and do everything I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. So when they lose, their theology told them it was God who had defeated them. They ask, why would God defeat us? And their understanding of God told them that he was all-powerful that he was almighty, that he couldn't be sovereign, that he could not be defeated. And their theology told them that he was attentive. They knew he was there. It was inconceivable to them that God could be dethroned. And they knew he wasn't busy elsewhere, and so they concluded, God has defeated us. But there's one issue we'll see in the text, namely that their theology didn't match their practice. Their knowledge of God told them that he was holy, that he was powerful, that he was sovereign and loving and kind. Yet we see a couple of books earlier in the book of Judges, knowing this God, they did not listen to him. Knowing he was all wise, they chose to do what was best in their own eyes. That is the repetitive frame of this people. They have good theology, but it was disconnected from their hearts. Their knowledge stopped at their head. Their heads told them that God was sovereign, but their hearts still grasped for control. Their head told them that he was worthy of worship, but their hearts preferred more tangible idols. Their head told them that God was enough, but their heart screamed they were incomplete without a spouse. Their head told them that God was provider, but their hearts convinced them to overwork, manipulate, and cheat on their taxes to be their own provider. It seems they had the same kind of mingled Christianity that has killed so many churches in the West. Let's observe their response to defeat. Verse 3, they say, Let's bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh. Then it will go well with us, and it will go with us and save us from our enemies. So, we've never done this, right? Nothing like this, right? You see what they're doing here? They are seeking to use their theology to provide a solution to the thing their heart actually desires. Their head knows that God is mighty. Their heart desires the protection of their status quo. And so their solution is to rub some God on it, trying to get the outcome that their heart actually longs for. No, they didn't want God. They wanted his provision. They ain't want God. They wanted his protection. They thought, let's go get the ark. That'll make it better. But Paul tells us, he says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that he will also reap. In other words, God is not a sucker, and he will not be played. Y'all, they sowed idolatry, disobedience, and disregard. And they were expecting to reap a harvest of God's grace and protection. So let me ask you, should we be surprised at the outcome? As the story goes, the ark comes, the people celebrate. They're expecting a victory from God. Even the Philistines are shook. They ask in verse 8, woe to us, who will rescue us from these magnificent gods? But in the battle, we pick up in verse 10. And it says the Philistines fought and the Israels were defi- and the Israelites were defeated. Each man fled to his tent. The slaughter was severe. 30,000 of the Israelite foot soldiers fell. 
The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. In the battle, it was a straight-up massacre. The body count was multiplied by seven, and they reaped what they sowed. God was not for them, but against them. And as we observe God's judgment against them, we must ask, what was it that got them here? Right? Like, obviously, it's a compilation of many things, but if you would allow me to highlight their pride, which brings us to our first point. We can expect God's judgment when our pride ignores our sin and yet expects from God. I'll say it again. We can expect God's judgment when our pride ignores our sin and yet expects much from God. Do you see the pride of the people here? Like they thought God couldn't see their hearts. They thought they could manipulate him onto their side. They asked why God defeated them in the first battle, but no one waited to hear from God. Their hearts weren't interested in his answer, just his blessing. No one approached him. This is so far removed from last week's prayer, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. No one invites God to speak. No one stops to listen. They didn't care to find out God's reason for being displeased with them. Instead, they let the fact that they were God's people go to their head and acted as if he owed them something. They assumed, they demanded, as a matter of fact, that God bless them, despite their complete disregard for him. And y'all, y'all, y'all got no steel-toed boots? Because some of us is doing the exact same thing. Some of us in here are sowing the same things that the Israelites sowed. Sowing a grand total of zero hours to be with Jesus and expecting his grace. Sowing sexual sin and expecting him to bless us with the spouse. Sowing a grand total of 60 hours to work, 20 hours to Netflix, and hoping that he will show up in our time of need. Y'all, it is our pride that convinces us that thinking rightly about God is the equivalent of loving him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We must learn from them. Let their experience humble us and lead us to repentance. My joint just jumped. Okay, here we are. It jumped hard all the way back to the beginning. All right. So here we are. Let their experience be sufficient to humble us. Right? Let it lead us to repentance. See their circumstance, right? Like, not only were they defeated, not only was there this staggering loss of human life, not only did they lose their two high priests, Hophni and Phinehas, but all of this was dwarfed by the reality that the ark of God had been captured. The unthinkable had happened in Israel. Their God had been taken from them, or worse, he had willingly left. And this would lead them to all kinds of questions like, was God for them? If so, would he respond to them with such disdain and vitriol and severity? Like, why would God go this far? Can you sit with them in their confusion and pain? Have you been there before? Are you there now? Can't you hear them crying out in anger and confusion? How could you do this to us? I thought, I thought you loved us. You know they felt wronged by God. But as we step outside of the story and ask objectively, were they? Was God just In his judgment, his people had been devastated. His people, they were completely disoriented. I 
as we seek to understand the, content, the extent of the people's confusion and their despair, verse 12 is really helpful. Now, I'm going to tell the story to kind of keep us on pace. But we get to verse 12 and we get old Eli, blind, who has moved his chair to the front of the gate of the city. He's waiting to hear the news. Someone who has been defeated in the battle runs all the way back to town. He passes Eli at the gate and he goes and tells the people the results of the battle. And the text tells us that the entire city cried out. There was a loud cry, and so Eli, sitting at the front of the gate, needs to know what happens. He calls out to the young man. The young man comes to him, and then methodically, the events of the day are revealed to the old priest. Well, Mr. Eli, sir, um, we lost the battle. Okay, what else? Well, sir, we, we suffered many casualties, and... Uh, both your sons, Hophni and, and Phineas, both of them died. Mm. Is there anything else? Maybe you can imagine a pause, a hesitation even, fearful of what this final piece of devastating news may do to the old man. Can you hear him stutter? Well, sir, we, uh, we also lost the ark. And this news was too much for the old man. The text records that he fell from his seat, broke his neck, and died. The news was so grim that it hurled him into his death. And this, for Israel, was the dark night of the soul, right? The hopeless part of the movie. The moment their guilt grips Simba as his father lay lifeless on the rocky floor. Everything had gone terribly wrong. And if we take toll of the damages, we see all their priests are dead. Their armies are decimated. Their borders are exposed. And the ark has been captured. Their hopelessness is summed up perfectly by Eli's daughter-in-law. In In verse 19, it says that Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and about to give birth. When she heard the news about the capture of God's ark and the death of her father-in-law and her husband, she collapsed and gave birth and her labor pains came on her. So hearing the news, she goes into early labor, and her distress turns into shock, and now she's in this battle for her life. And in verse 20, as she was dying, the woman taking care of her said, do not be afraid. You're giving birth to a son. But too much had been lost. She didn't care. Verse 21 tells us that she named the boy Ichabod saying, the glory has departed from Israel, referring to the capture of the ark and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. The glory has departed from Israel, she said, because of the capture of the ark. It's a sad story, right? Like, instead of rejoicing in the greatest honor that Eastern women could have at this point of time, giving birth to a son, she highlights the misery of her people by naming her child, the glory has departed. He's going to go by that for the rest of his life. An orphan named the glory has departed. There was no joy to be had here. His mother brought this boy into a world that she perceived to be godless. God had removed himself from them. Yahweh, their covenant-keeping God, was gone. He left. Y'all, his ultimate judgment toward them was not the massive defeat or even the deaths of the evil priests, but it was the removal of his presence. And isn't it ironic that it wasn't until this point that the people longed for God? It's funny how it works like that, right? And as we ask, what is God's heart and judgment, we gain an important clue here. For it was not until now that the people longed for what was once unimportant to them. And for the first time of the book, we see the people longing for God. And remember, we said, oh, maybe his judgment is necessary. And here we see it is not haphazard. 
right? Like it's not judgment for judgment's sake. If we look closely, we see God calling this people, beckoning this people, pleading with this stick necked people. Turn away from your rebellion and turn back to me. And here's the hard news of the text. Even with this stern warning, the people don't listen. We'll see this in chapter 6. Now, typically, you know, we just preach straight through the Bible, right? But for the sake of the story and for the sake of the sermon, will you skip, just fast forward ahead with me to chapter 6? We're going to come back to chapter 5, I promise, but it'll make sense. We want to stay with the Israel perspective, right? So they have just lost the ark, and we get to chapter 6. Verse 11, and it says this. Then they, the they here are the Philistines, put the ark of the Lord on the cart, along with the box containing gold mice and images of their tumors. What is going on here? We're going to see in a second. The cows went straight up the road to Beth Shemesh. They stayed on that one highway, lowing as they went. They never strayed to the right or to the left. The Philistines' rulers were walking behind them to the territory of Beth Shemesh. The people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting wheat in the valley. When they looked up, they saw the ark. <clears throat> now, if it feels like we're picking up in the middle of a story, it's, it's because we are, right? So here's all you need to know. The Philistines took the ark. Now they're bringing it back, right? And for the, for the Israelites, the text tells us that it's been seven months. Like seven months of mourning, seven months of regret, seven months without the presence of God, seven months of wondering. And like, just, just see the story, right? Seven months and they're harvesting wheat and over the hill comes two cows carrying a cart of five golden tumors, five golden rats in the Ark of the Covenant. Like, this is the most random assortment of goods ever assembled. And, like, there's, everything's wrong with this scene, right? Like, there's no army, no procession, no victory horns, no real, like, celebration of the ark returning, just a cow and another cow and a cart, right? Like, this is crazy. And they see the ark, and verse 13 tells us that they are Overjoyed to see it. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there near a large rock. The people of the city chopped up the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. What was their response? It was festive. It was even sacrificial. Everything seems to be good here, right? The ark is back. The people are happy. They literally throw a party. But y'all, all is not well. They still had not learned a very important lesson, namely the lesson of God's holiness. Their hearts were still prideful, and by the time we get to verse 19, they have desecrated the ark of God. So let me explain. God had given them a very clear directive on how to handle the ark. It represented his presence, and therefore they could not just handle it any kind of way. Get this, the God of the universe who shines brighter than the sun and has more force than the energy of a nuclear bomb dwelt among them. God dwelt among his people. But for their own safety, he said, you have to handle me with certain criteria. You have to handle me a particular way. He gave them laws to the Levites, and the people of the city are Levites. They know the law, but their celebration, in their celebration, they broke almost every single law imaginable. They broke almost all the laws pertaining to the ark. God was clear that not even the people who carried it were allowed to look upon it. It was to be covered at all times. But when the ark approached them, they were so excited that they didn't cover it. They didn't look away. Instead, they walked right up to it, opened it up, and looked inside. 
And so here we are, not even 24 hours of the ark being back, and they've desecrated it. And maybe in your heart you're like, bro, is that really that big of a deal? Like they opened the box and looked inside, but may I submit to you that the fact that our hearts lean that way is precisely the problem? Have we forgotten that God is holy? Like our culture screams to us like God has to be tolerant, right? Our churches propagate him as safe. We relegate him to the back seat of our cars and we act as if he need earn our worship. Yeah, I didn't really feel it today. But y'all, God is holy. Like we, we sang with our lips, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But do, does that connect to our hearts or does it stop at our head? It didn't connect to Israel's heart even after their defeat. They just waltz right into the presence of God as if they were equals. Their worship was festive. It was lively, but it wasn't reverent. And in their irreverence, it led them to do the thing that they called acceptable disobedience. The moment felt right. But disobedience is never acceptable into a holy God. And just as we can expect judgment when our pride ignores our sin, we can also expect judgment when irreverence leads us to embrace sin. Here's the reality. If sin is small to you, then God is small to you. When we say in our hearts, I know God said, but, or I know this is sin, but at least I don't, or maybe God just didn't actually mean this one. These statements say much about how we esteem God. And the results for Israel were catastrophic. Chapter 6, verse 19. God struck down the people of Beth Shemesh because they looked inside the ark of the Lord. He struck down 70 persons. The people mourned because the Lord struck them with a great slaughter. The people of Beth Shemesh asked, Who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord? This holy God, to whom shall the ark go from here? Then they sent messengers to the residents of Kirith Jima, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come get this, John. They sent the ark of God away. Family, I know this is heavy, but what we must see is that a holy God will not tolerate sin. Exposed in this text is the sinful heart of man. Like if we look, if we put an x-ray to our chest, we see that we are drawn to pride and prone to irreverence. These two are brothers, twins, two sides of the same coin each bolstering the other in our hearts, battling for position. In in the irreverence and the pride of Israel, they opened the ark and looked inside. And so, God slayed 70 more of them. And we cringe. And we long to look away. And again, we ask, is God's judgment just here? How can he say that he is for them, that he loves them? And when we hold up these two chapters and we observe them, maybe we conclude that God is harsh. Maybe we conclude that God is brutish even or unkind. We're struggling and wrestling to reconcile our hearts, this God of judgment with the God of love. But friends, what we will see is that the two don't actually need reconciling. Can he be both for us and against us? Well, let us consider one final passage. Rewind with me back to chapter 5, and just for a recap of chapter 4, okay, Israel's lost twice and got the ark stuck, right? 
That's where we are. So chapter 5. And the Philistines had captured the ark. They took it from Ebenezer and brought it into the temple of Dagon and placed it next to the statue. Right? And so here we are. We're with the Philistines now. And they are exuberant. Right? They are so excited. This is by far the greatest victory that they have ever achieved. Right? They, not only had they decimated the Israelite army, right, but they also had conquered the Israelite God. Right? They knew this God to be mighty. He's the God that freed them from Egypt. He's the God that went alongside of them on their conquest to the promised land. But on this day, to them, that God had fallen. And you have to remember, these are a people who worshiped idols, so it's likely that they perceived the Ark of the Covenant not only to represent God, but perceived him to be the very God of Israel. And so people, what they do, they bring them into the temple of the God that they believed fought for them, Dagon. And their expectation was that the God of Israel would now serve the God who had conquered him. You know, wash his floors, iron his drawers, that type of thing, right? But they would soon realize the gravity of their mistake. We pick up in verse 3, it says, When the people of Ashdod got up early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and they returned him to their place. And I'm sure they thought, that's strange. What went on about their day? Verse 4, but when they got up early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen with his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. This time, Dagon's head and both his hands were broken off, lying on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso remained. This is why still today the priest of Dagon and everyone who enters the temple of Dagon in Ashdod do not step on the threshing floor. And so basically, this is the moment they realized they had messed up, right? In their pride, they believed that they had conquered the God of Israel. In their irreverence, they thought that he would serve their God. Their pride and irreverence actually led them to an outright rejection of the one true God so that they could worship a statue. And we learn here that intricately connected are pride, irreverence, and idolatry. See how it hardens their heart. Their sin nature that lifted them up to the point of God in pride, and sought to drag God down to their level, irreverence, had convinced them that they had no need for God at all. Instead, they carved wood into statues and adorned them with gold and worshiped them. So prideful were they that they convinced themselves that the God of the universe would bow to the idol they have crafted with their own hands. They thought Yahweh would bow, but he would not. The first day comes, Dagon's laying face down in the dust. Cannot even pick himself up, so they have to lift him. And then the next day comes, and Dagon was back at it, face down, and this time with no head and no hands. And y'all, when I was reading this, I was like, man, am I watching the Black Panther? (laughs) Right, y'all remember that part where he's like, is this your king? Me. Right? Is this your king? Uppercut. Hey, auntie. You know what I'm talking about? I was like, man, Dagon is getting whooped. And when he was done with Dagon, he turned his attention to the people he ruled over. Verse 6 says, the Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod. He terrified the people of Ashdod and its territory and afflicted them with tumors. So get this, while Dagon lay headless and handless on his threshing hold, Yahweh's hand was heavy against the people. The entirety of the people of Ashdod cried out in their torment. And then they moved the ark, and all the people of Gath, the next city, cry out in torment. And then they moved the ark to Ekron. And by the time we get here, we see that they are moving the ark from place to place, and the Ekronites, they know, like, yo, we've heard about what happened over there. They basically meet it at the gate. They're like, yo, please, don't bring this here. 
We see in verse 10, they move the ark of Israel here of God to kill us and our people. And the Ekronites called out all the Philistine rulers together. They said, send the ark of Israel, God, away. Let it return to its place so it won't kill us and our people. For the fear of death had pervaded the city. And God's hand was oppressing them. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors. And the outcry of the city went up to heaven. So what do we do with this? Three places. Each of them we see God's judgment. And here in Philistia, we need to realize that this is not just God trying to make his way back home. Right? Like his judgments, even here, are purposeful. So we ask, like, why? What is God's purpose in infiltrating the compound of another God and making war against its people? And here the glimmer of light begins to shine through. Dare we say it? Could it be that he was revealing himself to them? Would they ever doubt again that Yahweh was the God of gods? Could this have been a precursor to the blessing of all the nations? Even here we see God's pursuit chasing people down, calling them away from the path they were on. Every instance of God's judgment in this story, he is revealing something about his character, about his heart and judgment. And all morning we've been asking, when can we expect the judgment of God? And we've answered pride, and we've answered irreverence, and we've answered idolatry. But y'all, there is a more important question. Not just the when, but the why. Why does God judge? The people's worship of idols, it has led them to all kinds of evil. And what we see here is that their pride and irreverence led them to idolatry, and idolatry, what we will see, it always leads us to death and decay. The people's worship of idols led them to sacrifice their children for worship, right? It led them to enslave their women for sex, for worship. It led them to oppress and extort the poor, for worship. All these things demanded by the gods for their own pleasure. And y'all, before we skate and think we're better than them, we must understand that our 21st century gods demand the very same high price. Does not our ideology of comfort and convenience lead us to sacrifice our own children at clinics? Does not our worship of sex lead to the enslavement of women in our $97 billion sex industry? Does not our worship of wealth lead us to invent all kinds of evil maneuvers to oppress and exploit the poor? Y'all, we can confidently conclude then that idolatry always leads to death and decay. And so, we should consider that the judgment of God against these things is grace. So as we zoom out and seek to conclude, we're asking, can God actually be for us and be against us? And we see that the answer is yes. For when God topples the gods of this world, and he topples our worship of them and the systems they create, he does it because he loves us. So what is God's heart in judgment? We see that it is love. And as we peel back the layer of the onion of God's judgment, we see that the very center of it lays his heart and his love for his people. His judgment towards those that he loves is not even judgment in the way that we typically think about it. But if we just turn the diamond a little bit, we see that it's actually the discipline of a loving father. When the author of Hebrews quotes Proverbs, he says, My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes everyone he receives as son. My son Deuce is four years old. He loves to race me. 
all the time. I'll beat you to the toilet. I'll beat you to the car. I'll beat you to the park. Always. And 90% of the time, I let them win. Oh, man, good job. But I can't let him win all the time. Because when I don't let him win, what he does is he hits his knees and starts crying. And you know what I do? I say, get your butt up. Go finish. Go touch it. You know why I do that? I can't have a quitter. His tears in that moment tell him his daddy is against him. His daddy didn't let him win. But my discipline is actually me being for him because I know that as a young black man, what the criminal justice system does to young black men who quit. And so I am for him in that moment by being against him. And so if I, as a broken, sinful, earthly father, know that I cannot just allow my son's heart to go after the thing his sinful heart chooses, how much more, God? Would he be a kind father if he allowed us to continue in paths of pride that destroy us? Could we consider him loving if, we allowed, if he allowed us to mature in the irreverence that causes us to eat from the forbidden tree day after day? Could we consider him God if when we sought to force him to serve in the temples of the gods we create, he submitted and surrendered and steady fighting on our behalf? No. Brothers and sisters, I do not believe we could. And there are some of us in here right now who are spurning the judgment of God, cursing him for his intervention in our lives. But can I tell you that it's because he loves you? Like, wake up, sleepy Christian. Or you who is running from God altogether, those hurdles, that pain, Your repetitive failure may be the evidence that God is actually for you, and maybe right now he just needs to be for you by being against you. And right now is the moment in the sermon where you're like, okay, well, was that thing judgment? Is that thing discipline? Is my current suffering judgment, my broken marriage, my loneliness, my debt, or my depression? Is this God? Oh, friend. May I remind you that that is the wrong question. There is a better question. And that question is, is the sin in my heart, the pride in my heart, irreverence in my heart, idolatry in my heart that I need to be repenting of? Like how would the story have ended if after the first battle the people of Israel would have just turned back to God and repented? Can't you see him running toward them like the prodigal father who scoops up his son? The story would have been different. And y'all, for us, the news is even better because the path to forgiveness is far more clear, far more dependable. We have no bulls to slaughter, no sacrifices to make. The work that needs to be done has been completed. So if you're searching your heart right now and you're finding sin that you despair of, I call you, do not despair. There is a way back to God. Y'all know the way. Y'all, they drove nails through his hands. They drove nails through his feet. They ran a spear through his side. And on Jesus, the eternal, unrelenting, fatal wrath of God was set. You know what this means for us? This means that the temporary judgment that you are experiencing, the momentary discipline of your father, It's all just to call you, remind you of the gospel that ensures that you never have to experience the wrath of God in that way. They sing it, that hymn. It's my favorite hymn. They say, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole was nailed to the cross. 
and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Hear me, friends, brothers and sisters. He is for you. Even when he is against you, he is for you. It is in love that he disciplines. It is in love that he judges. But hear me, brothers and sisters. You are loved. Let us turn to him in prayer. We're going to conclude today the same way that we've been concluding with just some opportunities to bring our hearts before the Lord. So the band is making their way up here. But we're going to take this time to really just search our hearts in our own space and in our own So here's the first thing I'm going to call you to pray. It's simple. We get this from Psalm 139. It says, search me, O God. And the question we're asking here is, is there pride, irreverence, or idolatry lurking in my heart that I am unaware of? Search me, O God. Is there pride, irreverence, or idolatry lurking in my heart that I am unaware of? Take that question before the Lord. And as you're praying, the Lord begins to reveal things to you. Repent. But repent with joy. Name them specifically. And then remind yourself of the gospel. Finally, as you are praying, thank God for his commitment to call us back to himself. Thank him that he disciplines you and doesn't let you run off on your own path. Jesus, you're good to us. All your ways are kind. All of your ways. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray that you would continue to come and get us, your children. You are, after all, the God who leaves the 99 and runs after the one. It is in your character to come after us. Oh God, we repent of our sin. 
our arrogance, our irreverence, of our pride, of our idolatry. Draw us close. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in your perfect name. Jesus, amen. Would you stand with us?